talked about some of the general overviews in developmental psychology, it's important for us to launch into the theoretical backgrounds to developmental psychology. Because we're holistic, we tend to draw on things like biological, psychodynamic, behavioral, cognitive, and contextual theories and wrap them all into one in developmental psychology. The discipline is so holistic, and so historically, we've drawn upon lots of different areas. Myself, I tend to see myself drawing on behaviorism and contextual the most, but I definitely draw on all five of the theories. When it comes to biological theories, what we're really looking at here is the influence of Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, is, in, in addition to looking at survival of fittest and natural selection, also wrote about baby biographies. This is the idea he wrote about how, as infants develop, they seem to have a mini evolution. The way they change in terms of their grasping and their motor movement tends to look like a mini evolution. And famous psychologist and founder of the American Psychological Association, G. Stanley Hall, looked upon Darwin's writings and actually was the first person in psychology to apply the idea of evolution to development. So he was very much looking at an evolutionary lens in, com in combination with developmental psych. And linguistic researchers like Noam Chomsky really emphasized the maturational theory, the idea that genetically we're hardwired to make certain milestones at certain points. We tend to walk and talk at roughly 12 months of age, as long as we're exposed to things in our critical period. And then we have John Bowlby positing the ethological view, the idea that most of our traits had an evolutionary purpose, especially with the child-parent bond. We know that children tend to bond to their parents through imprinting. This is the idea they see their parent and they want to model after them and be just like them. But what makes the parent want to take care of their infant? Their infant is exhausting. They don't sleep, they cry, they poop, they spit up all over the place, they bite. What would be the evolutionary drive behind parents wanting to take care of these crying poop machines? Well, Bulby said it has something to do with the cuteness factor and what is now called the QB doll effect. QB dolls were these toys that had very rounded and exaggerated features. They had big round eyes, big round cheeks and noses, round tummies, their arms were more round and cushy, and they look cute to us. And that's because there's a part of our brain that feels like round things are cute things. And this doesn't just happen for humans. If we think about dogs, puppies versus grown dogs, both adorable, but the puppy who has slightly more rounded features, their muzzles more round, their eyes take up a bigger proportion of their head, their ears are round, their paws are round. The puppy looks just a smidge more cute than the dog. If we think about kittens versus full grown cats, both cute, but the kitten with the more rounded paws, the nose is more round, the eyes take up a bigger proportion of the head, they just look a smidge more cute. And we find this pattern with many mammalian species. Think about piglets versus full-grown sows or boars. Think about baby pandas to full-grown pandas, a lamb to a full-grown sheep. Both very round, both very cute. But the lamb just has the edge. Or even other types of primates. The babies have more exaggerated rounded features that just seem to be more appealing to us. So this is one of the big biological contributions to developmental psychology in saying, aha, this is why we put up with the agony that is young parenthood. Now, aside from our biological heritage, we also do have influence from psychodynamic thought. Of course, we have Freud really emphasizing how early experiences matter, and there's a lot going on in our unconscious. He also posited the psychosexual theories, which some people still use, but they are more of a minority nowadays. We also have Eric Erickson with the psychosocial developmental theory, which tends to be more positive, more well-received today. But both of those really helped us to explain the object relations theory by Dr. Hornet and Klein. And this led into modern day attachment theory, most heavily championed by Mary Ainsworth. And so it's the idea that the unconscious attachment between parents and their children really do matter. Kind of what we were just talking about there. So that can also influence how we think about uh, caregiving and the roles of parenting in child development. Then we have the importance of behaviorism. Of course, we can't deny the role that classical conditioning plays in shaping who we become. We also can't deny the role of operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is used for so many things in developmental psychology. Parents, teachers, uh, autism intervention specialists all use behaviorism in shaping and guiding young people. 
In addition, vicarious learning, especially through media, can largely impact what we think and how we think about the world around us through the media we consume and even the media we contribute to. And so that was championed by Dr. Albert Bandura. Moving on, we also are influenced by cognitive theories. We know Jean Piaget was a big influence and still is an influence today in terms of understanding how infants and children think about the world in qualitatively different ways. And then we know Lev Vygotsky really highlighted the impact of influences and working together and the zone of proximal development. We'll talk more about that when we get to the unit of cognitive development. And then we have Binet, who looked at measuring intelligence in children and found what is typical for children to understand cognitively at certain ages. And finally, the last realm of influence we're going to talk about is the contextual theory. And this is how the context your parents provide, as championed by Diana Bonerine, or the context your peers provide um, from Ken Rubin, or just everything altogether, how it can influence you. Speaking of everything altogether, that's really we're talking about Yuri Bronfman Brothers ecological theory. So Bronfman Brothers ecological theory, it's a very broad theory and it describes lots of different zones of influence. And so at the very center of this theory is how the child can influence themselves or how the child's genetic and biological heritage can influence their development. So this is the idea of their gender, their health, their personality, that can all influence their developmental outcomes. Then moving outward, we have the microsystem. That is the direct influences in a child's life. So the people they see on a regular basis and that they directly interact with, their parents, their siblings, their teachers, their friends, their coaches. Moving outward again, we have the mesosystem. And that is how everyone in the microsystem interacts with one another. So children are not just influenced by their parents, but how their parents interact with each other and how their parents interact with their siblings, and how their parents interact with their teachers, and how their teachers interact with their coaches, and how their teachers interact with their friends, and how their coaches interact with their friends, and how their friends interact with their other friends. And so this is what's in the mesosystem. Moving up further, we have the exosystem. And this is the more indirect influences. You might not talk to everyone who goes to your school, or who's on your sports team, or who lives in your neighborhood, but the social norms at your school and on your team and in your neighborhood can still influence you. And that can happen indirectly through this exosystem. Then we have the larger macro system. These are the larger cultural influences like your culture, your religion, your ethnicity to the extent that ethnicity is not so much of a biological predictor, but it is a social predictor in how people are socialized to respond and treat you based on your ethnicity. Then there could be things like your geography, where you live in the world, what country you live in, do you live in a city or in the, or in the farm? And finally, we have the coronal system, and these are major events that happen in the formative years of a child's life. These could be things like divorce, war, pandemic, natural disaster, or they could be good things like getting adopted, getting a step family, immigrating to a new country, or having the internet. And so these areas of child factors, microsystem, mesosystem, exosystem, macrosystem, and chronosystem all work together to influence kids. And so that gives us a broad overview of how these different areas of psychology can all influence this one discipline of psychology today.